All right, we are live. Hello, hello. And let me bring Kathy's volume up. Uh, thanks everybody for joining us. As you know, I am Justin Lee. This uh, With me today is my friend, Kathy Baldock, straight advocate for LGBT plus Christians, author of, uh, there it is, Walking the Bridgeless there Canyon. <laughs> Founder of Canyon Walker Connections. Uh, which she founded in 2011 to, quote, repair the division existing between social and Christian conservatives and the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender community through education, training, encouragement, and dialogue in both secular and religious environments. So that is a, quite a mouthful. That's a that's a huge a mission. Lot. Yeah. So, so we are here live on Facebook to chat about all things silly and serious and to take your questions in real time. And then once we're done, a higher quality version of this video is going to be available on my YouTube channel at youtube.com slash geeky Justin. So um, I'm hoping this will be a regular thing. I'm excited. Uh, uh, are you ready for this, Kathy? Yeah. Can I ask the first question? Sure. Sure. Okay. Oh, wait. So, <laughs> so wait, wait, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to pull up here. From uh, Gilbert, uh, oh. Gilbert says, wow, you both look gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Gilbert. All right, go ahead, Kathy. What was your question? So in 2006, when yeah. I saw that article in the New York Times about GCN, uh, I... My old, first... my, 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 my old oh, nonprofit okay. that I founded for okay. the sake of folks who um, haven't followed me all this time. So because I'm persistent, mm -hmm. I called you and mm -hmm. I asked you if I could come to the conference, mm -hmm. um, which in that year was in Seattle, and I think are less than 200 people. So we had a conversation and I assured you that I was coming to, I mean, this sounds ridiculous now, but I was coming just to look at gay Christians because I had mm -hmm. never seen one. Like, like we're great. in the zoo, just look yeah. at us. I just want to come observe. Uh -huh. And I didn't want to change anybody or talk to anybody. I just was so shocked that there were gay Christians. And I just wanted mm -hmm. to come see myself. So when I called you and I showed up, what did you think? I've never asked you before. What did I think when you showed up? Yeah. Um, or, when you or when you called? You hunted you down. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what did I think? Well, I, you know, I... I was I was happy for you to come. I mean, when when I first started doing that work, it was originally essentially a support group for um, originally for just gay Christians and then gay and bi Christians and then, you know, LGBT Christians. I mean, you know, it kept growing. Yeah. And um, and at some point along the way, it became clear that there were straight Christians who were interested, who 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 cared about these issues and and um, wanted to be part of the conversation and wanted to learn. And my philosophy from the beginning was, uh, you know, as long as you're not here to preach at people, um, to, to, you know, tell people all the ways that you think that they're sinning, uh, you know, you're welcome. And, and I think, I think my philosophy in any of this kind of work is that, um, we're better off to turn our enemies into our allies than to turn our allies into our enemies. I think it's really easy to draw lines and say, only these people are welcome, only those people are welcome. And sometimes you have to have a safe space that's limited because people have been hurt. But as much as possible, I like to get people talking to each other. So, yeah. Yeah, well, I was excited. It worked out well. <laughs> it did, although, although, although I have to say, uh -oh. uh, you and I have very different... <laughs> approaches <laughs> to some yeah. of this uh and you're very outspoken i'm the quiet guy who like works you know quietly behind the scenes and says let's sit down and have a nice one-on-one -on -one conversation you know out of the spotlight so that we can talk about how we really feel you know and 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 you just come right in and i remember uh the first time i really kind of connected who you were was um you stood up in the middle of a, like, I mean, it was an appropriate time, but you stood up and... It was sharing night. Yeah. And I, you had a whole thing and like had, and I was just like, okay, wow. Because, <laughs> you, <laughs> and I, I, I never dreamed at that time, I think that we would end up, um, you know, becoming really good friends. 
because we do have such different like i'm so, anyway yeah we have different approaches you're the it it's a, you're you're the you're the you're the kathy griffin to my anderson cooper oh i'm not sure i'm okay with that <laughs> I only mean in terms oh. of like, in terms of like, she, she, when they used to do New Year's Eve stuff together, right? She's like, he, she was always the one who would just come right out and say stuff. And he was always like, um, is this being recorded? Right now? <laughs> There's a wonderful picture of us, the two of us together at a 10 conference, yep. um, having a meal. And I'm leaning really, I'm leaning way into you. And I'm sure you want to like fall back in your chair but I'm like talking to you, like I'm uh -huh. like right there talking to you. Uh -huh. And that picture is so much our personalities, but it is has it? worked all these years. It's a wonderful picture. I'll have to find it. It's a wonderful picture. Yeah. So people are, <laughs> the comments coming in through the, on, on Facebook, people are really um, uh, having a reaction to this, uh, to, to what we're talking about here. Um, there's a lot of laughing happening. Um, <laughs> Joel says, love Kathy's activism. Uh, Daniel says, different approaches. That's an understatement. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's I, I do remember that. Yeah. And I'm and I'm glad you came and I'm, I'm glad that we have uh, stayed connected all these yeah. years and last year last summer was the first time we ever were on a stage together at the same time that amazed me that's right that's right she was down in southern california yeah at yeah. evergreen evergreen baptist that was fun too so we'll have to do it again <laughs> every yes. 13 years we'll we'll, <laughs> we'll meet up somewhere and do a conference or something that'd be great chelsea says both of our approaches are necessary and heather says uh, I need to cook for both of you. Heather, you Oh, are... Heather, yes. She's in New Hampshire now. Yes, she does need to cook for us. You are welcome to she cook for me anytime because I don't cook. Very liberally. Very liberally. Which Sorry, is say wonderful. I she talked over you, Ken. Very liberally. Pours the wine very liberally. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so we've got a question. Oh, we've got yes. a serious question. I was going to start with some some like less serious stuff, but what people oh. are jumping right in. Uh, and so this is a question from from Mark. Mark wants to know, how do you reconcile your faith with things that are clearly written in the Bible and seem so hateful? I don't even know what that means. Um, well, I can I, I don't want to speak for Mark. I, I can guess uh, there are a lot of folks, uh, as I certainly don't have to tell you, um, who believe that the kind of pro LGBT plus work that that you and I both do in our own different ways um, is contrary to scripture. And, uh, and a lot of people have been a lot of people have used the Bible in ways that have hurt people. Mm -hmm. And and that, you know, when you see people use the Bible to hurt people, even when you know that they're misusing the Bible, does that make it hard for you to continue to be a Christian? You know, this is really interesting, S especially since doing the level of foundational work that I'm doing now. So I'm looking at background information. I don't think you could talk about how the Bible has been translated in modern history um, to be what I consider anti-gay. Some people consider that a traditional point of view. Um, I don't think you can just use the black and white words you see on a page. You have to understand the context that the translators were working in historically um, and if all the foundational pieces that were surrounding their lives as they made this decision, because we all, we all live in a context. So this work that I'm doing now with Ed Oxford looks at all the stuff going on progressively up to the 1930s but very much during the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. What was going on in the culture? What did people understand about the progression of human sexuality? Uh, what was the military's position on homosexuality, which really is very important when they're 20%, the employers of 20% of the people in the United States. 
What were medical professionals saying about it? What were psychoanalysts and psychologists saying about it? What were religious leaders saying about it? And also, what were what was the legal system saying about it? So when I look at all of those contexts, I can absolutely understand why the translation team of the 1946 New Testament RSV translated Arsenicoite and Malakoi, combining them up as one word, homosexual. I can understand why they did it. And because I can understand why they did it, I can have empathy and compassion about that decision. But I also can very clearly see that that was not God that did that. So my Christianity has actually strengthened because I realize that these things that are hurtful to people have really been done by people out of um, mostly ignorance. In the later years, 1980 and beyond, I believe there was malice and I can prove it. But before that, all the way, and I can prove it, I've got a <laughs> list to prove it, and you know I do. Um, but I think up, up until the NIV in 1978, I really think these translation decisions were done in ignorance. So it doesn't affect my faith. It's surprising that I think my faith has become stronger by doing this work. And when I share the work, that's what I hope people will also gain from it. Um, one of the common comments I hear after I speak is, that was so freeing because I realize now it wasn't God that did this. So. I I, I like that way of putting it. Um, and I, I'm torn because I, Every time I say the word torn, by the way, torn. people always make it right because my first book. Yeah. Um, but I'm torn because I I want to <laughs> I want to answer the question, but I also now that you've started this, I uh, you're talking about your new book that's not yeah. out yet. No. Uh so do you want to say something about that? Yeah, I, or, uh, I can always I can go back and answer the question. Started later. with so it all I've been teaching kind of on the other book, but I teach along a timeline. I think I'm the only one that teaches this way. I love to teach this way so people can all the people with all kinds of learning um, math methods can learn. And as I've been teaching and I got to this period of 1946, I would say and the translation team decided to change two words, two Greek words, arsenikoite, malakoite, to one word homosexual. And that's the first time it ever happened. And I had this picture in my head that it was done in the context, cultural context and ideological context, but not theology, because there was no, there was no theology. There was no theology on homosexuality until, shocker, shocker, the late 70s, early 80s, there was no theology. And so I would say this, that I believed it. And then one day, um, after teaching this many times, Ed Oxford said to me, he called me one day and he said, would you like to prove that? Well, I knew a few things. I knew I would always teach the ages of the men on the translation team. They'd been born between 1870 and 1917. You, you don't know very much about human sexuality if that's the time frame that you've lived and grown. So I knew the ages of them. I knew that it was done um, under the guidance of Dr. Luther Weigel. But I didn't take that next step and say, oh, I wonder what the translation notes say. So one day Ed called me and he said, would you like to prove your theory? It's like, of course I'd like to prove my theory that it was ideological and cultural. And he said, well, Dr. Le Weigel was the dean of Yale Divinity. Yeah, okay, I know that. And he said, all of his archive notes are at Yale University. Would you like to, and I mean, as I he didn't even have to finish the sentence. And it was like, would you like to go on a field trip? So September of 2017. Can I, can I just yeah. can I just interrupt you right now to say I don't know anybody who gets as passionate <laughs> about research yeah. as you do. I yeah. wish I had that level of passion about yeah. research. Um, yeah. I find it to be drudgery, and you get super oh, excited, and it's. Well, I love it. <laughs> I yeah. So and yeah. and. And we should say something about your first book is filled with a lot of research lot. for people who haven't yeah. who haven't yeah. read it. Yes, I've got it. I've got it somewhere. Oh yeah, here it is. It's with so my here. Bible. Let's do so this. There it is. We'll just, we'll, there we go. We're both holding oh, it at the same go. time. Oh, there we go. There we go. So um, the next book. So uh, 
So we went for five days and I was sure I was going to find detailed notes that said, this is why we did it. You know, we took these words and those dirty, filthy homosexuals. This is what we decided. We didn't find anything. And it was such a non-issue to them that that in itself was shocking. But then as we went further into the archives, we went through about 60,000 sheets of paper, digital and actual. And we found an exchange of letters from a seminarian written in 1959. And it was the only recorded letter to the translation team where this person said, I think you made a mistake. And because of that letter, it's caused an exchange. One of the, one of the letters from Dr. Luther Weigel, the head of the team itself, is three pages and they did three exchanges and it absolutely proved my theory that it was ideological and cultural and not theological they didn't have any understanding of human sexuality at the time they just said it was just like oh we took these words which james moffat who had been on the team translated as catamite and sodomite and said people don't understand those words anymore those words today mean homosexual boom done print so and then every subsequent bible after that most of them use that same work without going into the notes and what ed and i found which was stunning shocker was nobody had ever gone into the full archives ever before that's amazing i mean if you want to know what happened in the beginning you probably should go to the beginning and nobody had I mean, that's 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 really the part that gets me is, you know, it's one thing when you do research and then somebody else says, look, you know, other experts have done this same research and they've come to different conclusions. But it's quite another thing when when you're doing research and you are looking at primary sources and no one else has requested access to these primary sources, because then it's like, you know, for such a huge issue that is affecting so many people's lives why are we not doing this this kind of research so i i'm excited so all this is going to be in your new book yes yes so when when's it going to be out that's what everyone wants to know about a year okay about a year and it would have been i thought it would have been sooner but i keep doing work <laughs> <laughs> I keep, don't you like, hate that recently yeah because the way my head works is it says well, why is that? Why is that? Why is that? So then I find another layer of work to look at. I spend a lot of time looking at all the denominational journals, the Pentecostals, the Seventh-day Adventists, um, the Evangelicals, the, um, the Nazarenes. And I looked at their journals, some of them from the 40s, and said, what were they saying or not saying about homosexuality? And that in itself was fascinating. And then I also looked at pastoral psychology magazines. All these things take time because you can't just word search because they may be talking about 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10, but they may not be talking about homosexuality when they're talking about it, which is just as important as if they are talking about it. So I went through the pastoral counseling magazines. Um, that took quite a while to go through since 1950, every issue. And I found out that they didn't use 1 Corinthians. Here it was in the Bible since 1946. They didn't use it as pastors to talk about how do we help gay people until 1972. We tend That's... to assume that <laughs> we tend to assume that this stuff is like always been the way that it is, right? That like not. Yeah. No. Nope. Um, so oh my gosh, so many comments are coming in and I've thrown a few of them up short ones that I could throw up without interrupting your your flow here but let me just get to a few of the recent ones and I apologize to everyone I can't get to because there are just too many uh let's see uh whoa they're scrolling too fast for me to now every, as soon as I say that then everybody's like trying to get their comments out right uh so Zachary wants to know Kathy do you have a new t do you have a title for your new book I do we think and the reason we're going to use this title is when the seminarian wrote to Luther Weigel about the error that he believed that they made, he said, if you don't correct this, this verse will be used as a sacred weapon against um, homosexuals, that was his word, that love their church and love and would die for their Lord Jesus Christ. So we've decided to call the book a sacred weapon. Oh, I like that. 
it's a good like one right? it's okay a good... here's another recent uh uh comment this is from kayla who says um this is just really nice you both helped me as a teen i was raised catholic and went to a catholic school difficult was an understatement walking that path of being a gay catholic was and is intense i was a young adult and the church made me hate myself and who i was as a person hearing both of you speak and reading your blogs helped me learn that i shouldn't have to hate myself to love god you're both part of the reason i'm still here right now yay yay kayla so, yes yay kayla it's uh, kayla thank you for sharing that like it's it's this can be tough work and it's so important that we encourage each other yeah. um, and not just encourage. I mean, I know Kathy and I both always can use encouragement, but it's but not just us, like everybody, like everybody, even the people who are just just living their day to day life, you know, being honest with even a few people in their life about what they're going through, um, just, you know, need your encouragement. Um, OK, goodness, so many, so many comments uh, coming in. Um, uh, Michael wants to know, Kathy, where would you suggest someone to start researching this academically in addition to your books, of course? Okay, so here's the list I always give. This is how I um, academically is this. It, I'm going to take that word out for a second. Um, okay. I think when someone starts this work, they should start with your book. And I've always said that. It's not just my because book. you're yeah, your book. Torn. With, torn. So, torn. There is, it is. Over there. I see it. Torn. There there's a couple is. of things. Oh, yeah. Bring it out. Bring it out. Absolutely. Torn. Hey, we, <laughs> when you're an author, you, you got to be your best self-promoter, there's, right? There's your, so I say torn. Then I say my book because um, it's got so much uh, foundational history. Then I say Matthew's book, God and the Gay Christian. Matthew Vines. And then I say Brownson's book. But I James also Branson. have recently added on um, Karen Keene's book, hmm. um, which I'll, I could reach. It's right over there. But Karen Keene's book, it's got an odd title. One second. Uh, okay. This book. She, it just came out about two months ago. Karen Keene's book. Hello, Karen, yes. if you're watching. It's got a scripture, like, scripture ethics that. and the possibility of same sex relationship. So yeah. she was side B for... 17 years and this is a really good um accessible academic book so brownson's academic this is academic but i think um and mine actually is but i write it so accessibly that it doesn't seem academic but it is it's got 500 footnotes it's well researched but i think those are the books that should give somebody some pretty compelling evidence and i do think that sacred weapon will be very high on that list. So I'm writing all of the social history, uh, the the history of the understanding of sex, human sexuality, um, the legal history, the medical history, all of that. I'm writing all of that and all the context, the background stuff. And Ed, who's been to seminary and understands Greek and Hebrew, is doing all the Bible stuff. So I think we're a really good team together because Ed is gay. And so and here I am straight. And so we are, um, we're just a good team. You've been with us together. We're just, we're just a good team. And so that book I think will be really academic. Awesome. But access I care about accessible. So uh, a, a, a bunch of folks in the comments are offering their own suggestions for resources. Um, I apologize. I'm not going to be able to get to all of them because I have other questions that I want to ask Kathy, but, uh, but you know, folks who are following this can, can read along as folks are, are suggesting things. Um, so, uh, I want to ask you this, Kathy, because you just talked about how the person you're writing the book with, Ed, is, is gay, um, and you're straight. Um, have you found doing this work as an ally have you found certain challenges or certain advantages, um, things that you feel like are different for you than they would be that maybe you had to adjust to or just that you learned about that, that would be different for folks who are LGBT plus, plus, plus? Well, it's not. Ooh, I can, especially this stage of the work I'm doing now, I can go in with fresh eyes to look at things because there's no deep internal wound, right? Mm. Um, oh, I like that answer. So 
I am not going into something with hurt, which I can understand people approaching God and the Bible and Christianity with lots of hurt and with lots of filters. I'm going in with really just unbelievable curiosity. And sometimes I've also said, I think this is why Matthew can do good work is because Matthew is young enough to have missed the whole reparative therapy, the really angry times. I think between 1980 and 1992 were the really angry years of Christianity against uh, LGBT Christians. And people that have lived that time, you can work through as much as you want to work through, but that pain has got to um, somehow color how you look at things. And I, Matthew has escaped that because of his age. And because I am not gay, I can have um, less filters on my eyes when I look at this. And the curiosity really has helped me understand this. And I, sometimes I've been wrong about what different translators have thought. And I've been able to genuinely ask and really care, like for the Living Bible, 1971, Kenneth Taylor. We went and looked at those notes, too. And I really believed that when he made those translation decisions, that he made them out of malice. And when I saw the evidence before me, and I was able to see the evidence because I'm not like deeply wounded by things. And I think that's an advantage in this. I appreciate your saying that because, and the, when you're talking about Matthew, I'll say again for our viewers who don't know all the, the players in this work, you're talking about Matthew Vines, the founder of the Reformation Project and author of God and the Gay Christian. Um, and yeah, you know, I, I hadn't thought of, I mean, I know that he certainly grew up um, in a a space where it was very difficult for him to to come out. But but you're right that the X gay movement um, was much stronger, like when I came out, than it was when he came out. Absolutely. And so there are certain things about that that may affect me emotionally differently than they would him, and certainly differently than they would than we they would you. And it's something that that uh, yeah, that's important for us to recognize. And I appreciate you're saying that. Oh yeah, I, so so um, you're getting a lot of love in in the comments. <gasps> Yay! Now th there is there's there's a criticism that they came in. Do you want to you want to take on a lay a it critic? on me? Okay, yeah. so this is from Lindsay. So Lindsay says um, in response to what you were just saying, I feel like you do go into works from celibate LGBTQ Christians with the intention of tearing them apart. How do you? How do you, what's your feeling about that? How do you respond to that? I, I've been known to review the books written by celibate Christians. And I don't, and I think if you read the, my reviews of those books carefully, you'll realize that I'm not tearing who they are apart. I'm looking at their theology or how they're using verses. And if I think they're misusing verses, I will call that out. Um, I think uh, some of the people that were the side B Christians, um, I could name them, but they would, they have been the people that have long time been in that gay Christian organization. Um, they were my friends for years, and some of them came and even stayed at my home. And I think they would support me in saying this, that I how I treated them, that I would treat them just like anybody else, because I figured... They have their own way of thinking of things. They have their own filters. They have their own experiences. They come to their own decisions. I've never pressured anybody. But when I see that somebody uses a tool to hurt others, I will speak up. So, so you know, I interpret it as not making space for people, but I don't feel like that's what I'm doing. You know, it's a, it's such a tough it's such a, a tough thing when we're talking about. Um, issues that people see as as moral issues um you know i'm very aware that for some of my straight christian friends um who believe that uh same-sex marriage and relationships are are sinful that there's a difficult uh tightrope to walk there in terms of um loving and supporting me um 
while having a, a major theological disagreement with the stuff that I teach. And I think in a very different way, there's a, a challenging, um, it's, it's challenging we talk about side A and side B. So I'll, you know, for those folks who aren't familiar with these terms, uh, side A uh, refers to the theological view that, that Kathy, you and I have that says that uh, that God blesses marriage equally regardless of the gender of the partners. And side B refers to what a lot of um, what a lot of us grew up hearing was the the Christian uh, position, the idea that um, that God's design for marriage was between an, a man and a woman. And so if somebody is attracted only to the same sex, not the opposite sex um, and their side B, then then generally they will choose a path of celibacy. Um, and for my side B gay Christian friends um, who are having to live celibate lives which had brings its own set of challenges in between um a side b christian world that often doesn't understand that they're that they're gay or, or for some of them that they are somewhere else in the on the lgbt plus spectrum and then the the lgbtq you know community that doesn't support them because they're side b like i realize it's a really tough place to be and and it's um you know, I've I've been criticized a lot because I try to because I've I've worked in my life to create spaces that are welcoming to folks in that position, and there are a lot of folks who've criticized me for that, feeling like I didn't take a strong enough uh, position against side B as they would say harmful theology. So it's a it's a tricky tricky place to be, and I mm -hmm. my my heart. Like I, I know Lindsay who asked that question and, and right, I know Lindsay, right. Yeah. And I, Hi, I, um, I really, really struggle with how to, to walk that line. It's, it's tough. And I want to talk more about that, but then there are all these other <laughs> questions coming in. Um, and somebody, uh, hang on, if I see if I can, here's, so here's another question. Uh, when do we move on to the issue of being Christian and transgender? I don't think it is quite like being gay in the 80s or 90s, but transphobia is at its height at the moment in society and consequently in the church too. Many remain closeted and live a lie. Right. Um, so a lot of what we've talked about thus far has been sexual orientation. Um, have, you, have you done a lot of work uh, with regard to being trans and Christian? So I have um, several good friends are trans and Christian. Um, what I, so the timeline I see on this is the church didn't care about transgender Christians. They would have said transsexuals for the longest time until marriage equality was now off the table. So it's the next issue you care about. And why I think the church is fighting so hard is historically, Historically, socially, politically, and then religiously, very much within the Catholic Church it started, people have cared about keeping gender norms tight and not blurring the line between male and female. Because if you blur the line between male and female, all of a sudden the patriarchy, oh darn it, starts to fall. And so when biblical feminism came into the church in the 1980s, the church, the traditional church kind of woke up and said, oops, got to stop this because now women are going to be, want to be pastors, teachers, leaders. So when you allow same sex couples to marry, those gender lines, those gender norms start to fall. Well, the last absolute place that I believe you can hold them that they want to hold them is born male, born female. That's the final line for us. If we let this fall, all the other things fall. Mm -hmm. And I also have a belief that feminism was much stronger in the 70s. When I became a young woman, when I went to high school and college, it was in the 70s. And the 70s were a great decade for feminists. I didn't have to fight for it. The women before me did. I just benefited and 
the religious rights shut that down. And I really believe that women's rights, women's equality is on the backs of LGBT people fighting for blindness to sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression. When all of those things begin to fall, I think we're going to turn back and women's equality will also rise within that. We're all tied together. This is all tied together, but it has to do with keeping those lines really, really tight. So 10 years ago, I can assure you, the church was not talking, I, I have the evidence again, about transgender and Christian. The verse they were using was Deuteronomy 22.5, is it 22.5? About don't wear the clothes of the other sex. That's what they were using. They weren't using Genesis 1 and 2. They were using don't dress in each other's clothes. Yeah, growing up, I heard a, I heard a lot of anti-gay stuff in my church, and I didn't hear any discussion about gender identity at all. And in my work, I find that I've, I hear from a lot of uh, church leaders who say, uh, you know, on when it comes to gay stuff, we, we, we want to know how to wrestle with this passage and this passage and this passage. And we, you know, we don't agree with you on this and we, but you know, we want to know how to be loving. And, you know. and then when it comes to transgender stuff, we don't really know. It's, we don't know. Help us get started on this conversation. Um, I would love, so it, for it, in case this isn't obvious to anybody, what I am hoping to do with this thing that we're doing is um, have a series of different guests on with different yeah. areas of expertise and have different conversations. So I absolutely want to have uh, some conversations with side B folks and some conversations with trans folks um, and and explore some of this stuff more and and it's you do the trans i really yeah. want you to do older trans people and younger trans people because that journey is so different like you know i know and adore lisa salazar in vancouver hmm. well she's approaching 70 and so her experience of being trans is going to be completely different than someone like austin harkey right totally different so um just like your experience is different than Matthew's experience is different than, you know, Ralph Blair's experience, all different. So age matters. So yeah. have that's very true. That yeah. Thanks yeah. for that. Okay. So I'm going to, uh, so we're getting a ton of serious questions and I want to try to get to more serious questions, but uh, you know, I'm having a conversation on Facebook with Kathy Baldock. We can't just have only serious conversation. <laughs> so, I've got some questions. I've got some oh. questions. Oh no. <laughs> Hope they're not pop culture. Oh, I don't know anything. <laughs> yeah, I mean, let me pull out my trivial pursuit cards. Oh, <laughs> and, no. <laughs> no, because I want to have some fun here. So, Okay. Kathy. Yes. Favorite food. What do you like to eat? Um, I like food with spices but not too hot. I love ethnic foods. My favorite absolute two foods or two dishes. Roba Vieja, which is a, a shredded beef with capers and tomatoes and cinnamon dish on rice with uh, f fried plantains and, and black beans. That's probably my favorite meal. But I love crab. I love crab cakes. I love crab. So yeah. I, um, I, I, I lived for a few years when I was young in Baltimore and uh, uh, there are crab houses everywhere in Baltimore, and I did not like it as, as a kid because you go yes. in and they have the crabs and the mallets, and you're supposed. And I was like, no, I cannot yeah. do this. This is like squishing cockroaches on a giant scale and then eating them. I just can't. Do it. I was in I was in Baltimore in July because I was keynoting at the Seventh Day Adventist, the kinship camp meeting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and afterwards, my buddies Tracy and Jennifer they took me to one of the crab houses. And because Jen is like so proficient at smacking and peeling and picking, like she was ahead of me and she was smacking, peeling and picking for me at some point. But and it was it really was a mess. I had to go in with an extra T-shirt over my clothing. It's a mess. But that's OK. Some more. I'm going to ask you a few more ridiculous questions. Okay. And then I'm a ton of comments are, are going through. Oh, well, OK. So someone has is repeating a question from earlier that is not serious. So we'll we'll drop this one in here. Stan wants to know, uh, 
<laughs> repeating my question from earlier, he says, with a, a you know, a uh, level 10 snark because uh, I because <laughs> I'm missed it as all these. I'm trying to listen to what Kathy is saying here. And the comments are got to be two. Right. Ex <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Justin must answer first, he says. If, oh, you were, okay. if you were stranded in a in snowy mountainous terrain, what is the top tool or item from your home you'd call a must have? I have to answer this first. So do I look like somebody who would ever be stranded in snowy mountainous terrain and have a tool on me? I, I, uh, I mean, the top item from my home that would be a must have would be a, my smartphone with cell <laughs> signal so that I could call someone to get me out of the snowy mountainous terrain. <laughs> Which I would, would be a real object, I would probably have my headlamp um, mm. because then I could shine it up and people could find me and I could find my way around and yada, yada. But if it were just something for my home, I would like retroact that and like make it be my son who doesn't live in my home, but he's 32 years old and he's one of the absolutely most capable outdoors people I know and he's just wicked smart about stuff and I adore him and I've always said if I had to get dropped anywhere on the planet the one person I would bring with me would be Andrew Baldock that's who I would want <laughs> yeah there, there you go uh but if okay. I had to go somewhere fun I would bring Sammy Baldock <laughs> my daughter <laughs> favorite dessert uh creme brulee Ooh, creme brulee mm -hmm. I, I had a, Forget I had a it. philosophy professor uh, in college who always used creme brulee as the example of like the the fanciest, most supreme dessert. And then I tried it for the first time and I was underwhelmed. Well, it's also really easy to make and I'm gluten intolerant. So it's a good one for me. It's safe. Yeah, there you, there go. you go. Um, recommend us a TV show to binge watch. I don't have TV. I haven't had TV. Do you have in... like? I have One Netflix. Of... Okay. I'm reading. I'm watching right now, and I I suggested this to Stan the other day. I I go through them, and I only watch. I don't like focus on things, but I'm watching a show, a series on uh, Amazon right now, called Being Erica, and it's this thirty-something-year-old woman that gets to think about decisions in life and maybe go back and redo them or look at why she makes decisions and i find it fascinating the characters are wonderful um and i'm that's what i'm binge watching now as i do dishes or cook or yeah i like it being erica it's on amazon okay there you go yeah. um so we'll get i promise to get back to some serious questions here but we've got a uh, a non-serious question from one of our okay. viewers jd wants to know does pineapple <laughs> belong on pizza not on my pizza. No, <laughs> not, on, not on my pizza. Uh, I mean, if it were there, I would eat it. But, all, you know, my favorite pizza is one locally. It's called Linda Pizza. And I can eat it because this place makes it with called, it's called Double Zero Wheat, so I can eat it. And they put on it, it's going to sound crazy, a zested lemon, oil, and arugula. Oh. And it's my favorite pizza. So, like, does arugula belong on pizza? Does zested lemon belong on pizza? I say yes. There you go. You know that that is that is the most that that is the most nuanced answer I think I've heard to that question. People are like fiercely like have strong opinions about pineapple on pizza. I absolutely like pineapple on my pizza, but I will not push anybody else to have pineapple on their pizza if they do not like it or are allergic or simply choose not to. Inclusivity. Inc absolutely there is a side a and a side b to pineapple on pizza yeah <laughs> there are people there are people there are there are people who think pineapple uh is perfectly fine on pizza and there are people who think that uh they just you know choose not to and there are people who think that it's morally <laughs> wrong to put pineapple well, it on has pizza to have chicken and goat cheese with it it okay. can't just be there. like it can't I be with roni I have would, chicken and cheese. I would eat that. I would yeah, eat that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, 
here's 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 a a, a segue into some more serious stuff. Um, do you get stressed out by doing this kind of work? Because I do, and I would like to know if you do. What do you do to deal with the stress? I don't get stressed out. It doesn't is, stress you out. No, isn't that amazing? No, <laughs> isn't that crazy? Because um, I see the productivity of it. I see the benefit of it. I completely enjoy it. And anyone that knows me knows that I have an absolute out every day of my life. I go hike. And because I have that hour and a half break, and it's sometimes in the year I go out and hike twice, um, I have this way where I disconnect from everything and it kind of brings me back into balance. I live about 10 minutes from about two dozen hiking trails. That's pretty amazing. I live in the Sierra. I live at 5,600 feet elevation, northern Nevada. Got 15 inches of snow in my drive today. I went snowshoeing today. And that, that action of getting outside away from things has for three decades worked to calm and balance me. I don't know what I would look like and how I would behave if I didn't have that outlet every day, but it doesn't frustrate me because I see the benefit of the work. So I know it's productive and good. And um, it really is, you're right. Research completely excites me. And so I like doing what I'm doing. Um, I have, um, I don't get frustrated with things easily. The thing that most frustrates me, and it not even it so much anymore, maybe it's because I'm older. I'm 62 now. And, you know, things just kind of slough off at this age by this time. But what I, what I get most frustrated about is when somebody really does not understand me and misrepresents me. And that's a personal thing. But that doesn't even really frustrate me anymore because I just say, like, if you want to get to know me, get to know me. If you don't, like, you're lost. And I really do believe that. Mm. I am, you know, if you want to have conversation with me, let's do relationship. But no, I don't get frustrated. I get more encouraged than frustrated. Yeah. I, I wish. <laughs> you see? Don't you want to be me, Justin? Don't you want to be me? <laughs> I, that is not something that I've ever said before. You see that? It's a consideration. <laughs> but, um, but I mean, I, I wish I could do this work without, I mean, I, you know, as you said, I mean, the, the, the fact that I'm gay makes it harder to do this without getting stressed out by it. Um, and I, you know, I try to know my limits. Um, like for me, one of my, one of my de-stressors is board games. I yeah. I have game nights. I invite friends over and do something where we're interacting face-to-face -face without screens in front of us because it's so hard these days to actually have a conversation with people without people constantly checking their notifications on their phone. And, and they're not doing it to be rude. It's just that we're so addicted. We don't know how to go an hour with it, when stuff buzzes, we feel like we need to check it because it's important and we ignore the people in front of us. And it, it's uh, and that we could talk about that another day. But uh, board games for me are really like having a, a group of people and, and to do games, especially board games that have physical pieces. Some of the games I play involve screens, actually. But like, you know, have like physical things and 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 human interaction where we don't talk work is nice. Um, OK, so. Wow, we got like 10 minutes left um so there was there was a, a comment that's come in a couple of times um that i'm gonna i'm gonna pull up here here it is from tim it is. do you think that the church will come after bisexuals if you prove gay is okay because bisexuals can choose to be straight no i don't i don't think they will I think even in the conversations, I think what I'm reading, and I think of one of the most prolific readers of anti-gay, anti-trans books around. I read them all. 
I review most of them. And most of those books aren't even touching on gay, uh, on bi people. They're not even acknowledging that this bi thing exists. Mm. They're, it's like not even on their most of their radar. They're just right. not acknowledging it. And I think... <laughs> bi invisibility gonna, is a thing. Yeah. I think they're going to go right from gay to trans. I mean, like... Why stop it by? <laughs> it took me a moment to figure out what you meant by, I think they're going to go right from gay to trans. I'm like, who is? Oh, oh, you mean in terms of the focus? Yeah. And so like, why, why do this station stop it by people when we can just go right after trans people? Yeah. yeah. I think they're. I think, yeah, by invisibility is happening in all kinds of places because I read these books and most of them don't acknowledge that people are bi. I think, I mean, I think you're right. I don't see a lot of theology, a lot of anti-bi theology. It's it tends to be they focus on on gay, and then and then like you said, they jump to trans. I think one thing that it, um, perhaps the this person's um, getting at that I think is is something that we have to consider is that often we start the conversation, at least I know I do, with um, examples of gay people and for me it's easy to use myself who don't have a say like for whom heterosexual marriage is not a reasonable option and then and then it's like okay so your solution for me is just marry a woman but that's not reasonable because i'm gay and i'm not attracted to women and here are why here are the reasons why that would be bad and then so so then if we start from there, then we can talk about, so what does it look like for me? And I know some of my bi friends worry about that approach because then it's like, yeah, but then you're unintentionally perhaps throwing bi folks under the bus, which is why it's important to me then to go back and say, um, you know, but I'm, I may use that example to get somebody to rethink, to like question some of their assumptions, but it can't stop there. Like the, we need to go back and say, look, you know, if, if we're saying that ultimately that two people of the same sex can fall in love and have the same kind of love that a straight couple does, then that is true regardless of uh, whether the person might sometimes have attraction to the opposite sex. Like it's not dependent on that, right? So like there's a whole, you know, but it gets complicated. It's a, it's a complicated argument to to make and it's important to have it in a way that doesn't throw people under the bus but that you know um and we got a, a comment on this uh from jd from pineapple jd um who will forever be known uh, uh on this <laughs> video as pineapple jd um who wrote i thought being gay was a choice for years because i was quote choosing to be straight the truth was i was repressing my attraction to men and it was really hurting me right and I'll tell you, it is just so fascinating going through this progression of human sexuality. And I wanted to bring up something funny. Can I bring up something funny? Yes, absolutely. Of course. Of course so it's can. research. So I was talking to a friend about this the other day, Alicia. If she, Alicia's watching, we I was in Arizona taking care of my mother last week, and went for a wonderful three-hour walk with Alicia. And I was telling her that I'm trying to go so far back in history to see when people started really talking about this deviation from procreative male-female sex. And the first person that really wrote about it was a guy named Heinrich Kahn in 1844. He wrote uh, Psychopathia Sexualis in Latin. I mean, there's something completely not accessible. And, he, and then uh, Kurt, uh, Richard von Kraft Ebbing took the same title and wrote in the 1890s, but the first person that wrote about it, and he wrote about, he wrote about sexual perversions. And a perversion, so verse means to turn from the truth or turn from what is real or what is natural. And so to turn, he saw the kinds of sex that were not male dominant, male, female, and towards procreation. So he put them into six categories. And this was the first guy that ever looked at sexual perversions. Um, and here's his categories. I Sometimes I miss one. He used lesbianism, but lesbianism at that time meant um, it could involve men. It just meant rubbing your, you know, these, I hope, are you all over 18? Sign off. Yeah, okay. Um, rubbing your genitals on the thighs of another person. It could be a man doing it to a woman or a woman doing it to a woman. So that was lesbianism. 
Then there was sodomy, you know what that is, and then there was masturbation, and then there's uh, necrophilia, sex with dead bodies, and then there's bestiality, and the sixth category, all perversions fell under these one of these six categories. The sixth category he saw for sexual perversion in 1844 was sex with statues. Statues. I love this story because I already heard it from you once and so I knew it was coming, but like, what? What? It's, really, it's a really good emulsion for your skin. I mean, who, you know, who needs peach scrub, right? It, have sex with a statue and like all of that dead skin will just rub right off. Conversations I never expected to have on Facebook Live. <laughs> I I know so much weird stuff. Yeah. That is the thing. When you spend enough time in, in, in this field, you learn a lot of really weird things. Oh, yeah. It, there's... There's there's so much of it that's funny. It's unfortunate that's at the expense of oppression through time. But what people have thought, it's really funny, you know. And there's the whole period of the late 18, 1850s to nineteen tens when people really believed that masturbation caused homosexuality. So apparently, only those that were going to be homosexual were masturbating because. That's what caused, that was the number one cause of homosexuality. So there you go. And that's have... why in the late 1870s, 80s, little boys were, there was this huge rise in masturbating little boys. I'm not masturbating, um, circumcising little boys to stop them from masturbating. Right? I, I know ridiculous things, Justin, right? I'm, I'm going to have to label this whole, <laughs> this whole vidcast NSFW. It's... <laughs> What's that category? Not, uh, not, not safe for work. <laughs> it's for. <laughs> but it's this is the for... history of human sexuality. We yeah. have been, we have, I mean, in human sexuality, the discussion of human sexuality really began with talking about the sex life of plants, botany. It's, it's fascinating work. All in the next book. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Kathy, Stan, Stan had a comment on this. He said, sex with statues, there's a whitewashed tomb joke in there somewhere. <laughs> oh, I think there might be. Hashtag might Bible be. jokes, hashtag pastor jokes, hashtag not your grandma's pastor. <laughs> so um, so th this is the, the only thing I don't like about doing these kinds of live events is so many comments and questions come in that we don't have time to get to. And um, part of what happens is people ask a question and it just doesn't happen to be because I've what people don't know is the interface that I've got because we don't have somebody else running this thing because we're not rich like that. Um, the interface that I have has like a, a, a window with comments and they scroll by really fast. And so sometimes I'll see a comment go by and I'll be like, oh, I didn't have time to read that one. And sometimes a comment will come by and be like, well, I asked this before, but, and then, you know, but, but we're in the middle of something and I'm like, oh, I'll get back to that. And then it's gone by the time that we have time to get. And then people are like, why haven't you answered my question yet? And I'm sorry for people that like, we're not and ignoring it's not you. it's on me but... because I can't see any of those questions. No. It's all on you, honey. It's all on It's you. on me. It's there on me. But mm -hmm. here's the good news. The good news is I will be doing more of these with mm -hmm. with other people and, and and hopefully we'll bring Kathy back as well if she will agree to come back and then we can answer. <laughs> you know, more I questions. got more funny stuff. I know you do. And I'm excited. So, OK, so um, tell us with this book, this, this yeah. new book, you said it's going to be out in like a year. Yeah. Yeah. After um, I think. I think I'm done with research. I thought I was done with research about two months ago. And then I went on this whole tangent of looking at denominational magazines and periodicals. And and then this past week, my question has been, how did this look in the legal system? So I spent five or six days on looking at sodomy laws. And when I told my daughter this the other day, she said, what are you doing today, mom? And I said, I'm reading a legal book on sodomy from the 1860s to present. And she said, like no other mother says that, Mom. Like, <laughs> thank <you're> goodness. Right. <laughs> thank goodness that you do. Yeah. Not so, thank goodness that they don't. Thank goodness that you do. 
we, we certainly a appreciate you. Fascinating layer that I didn't know was so important. Well, so I so, find these layers. So for folks who haven't read your your first book, real quick, because we should wrap this up because it's uh, it it is now <gasps> nine o'clock Eastern. But for folks who have not read your first book, since they can't get your new book yet, Walk, Walking the Bridges Canyon, you want to give a quick synopsis of what is this book for folks who are wondering yeah. if they should pick it up? So I, it's, um, it's more, I look very briefly at the progression of human sexuality, very briefly. And then I also look at uh, the impact of politics, uh, psychotherapy, um, and then I do a chapter and a half on looking at the verses in the Bible. And then the last four or five chapters are people's stories. So I try then to give people their voices and it's like, how does this affect gay people that were, were destined to be in ministry and are in ministry? How does it affect gay children? How does it affect parents with gay children? Um, so I look at how does it affect people in marriage, you know, um, in terms of wanting to be married. Uh, want, this is just before marriage equality. So I let people have their voices too, but I thought think it's important to lay out the history. And then once you have some understanding of the history and Bible, then bring it home with people saying, this is how, this is why it's important in my life. This is what it's done in my life. So um, I'm delighted with that book. Um, but it's just the next level of questioning. And I think I'm gonna be, a th this next book, I'm just so excited to write it. So I've got uh, the introduction and the first chapter done, and then I made the mistake of saying, well, what came before 1860? And that's how <laughs> I ended up with sex with statues, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> well, I, did, I didn't personally have sex with statues. And I don't know who. Thank goodness, did. because that is a story that I do not think you could tell mm -mm. on this. They would thing, come after show. They'd come after me. Yeah. Whatever this so. is. Um, okay, so uh, for people who want to get in touch with you, Kathy, yeah. your website is canyonconnections.com. But I'll come to your page and I'll answer questions. Awesome. So <laughs> all these comments that people have been posting you are welcome to answer as many of them as you want i will just tell people in advance i try to answer as many facebook comments as i can i am not going to promise to go through all the comments here i will read them i promise i will read them but um but i've got a lot going on this week i will tell you on my side of things i have got some new youtube videos coming very soon and this video of us is going to be up on youtube as well i'm in the midst of editing editing multiple ones one of which i'm really excited about and uh it'll be up very very soon so stay tuned you're make sure very you're... good at videos you're very Aww. very fair i mean Thank the you. graphics and the you're really good at it yeah i appreciate it well yeah. uh there's more i have been filming in a studio uh here which is brand new so it will it's already my footage is like the quality is is up from my earlier one so i'm really excited about wow. that my patreon patrons have already seen um a blooper reel from some of the stuff that i have uh been shooting so um yeah so people who want to support me on patreon can see that but the new videos will be up really soon but this will be up on my youtube channel in a high quality version higher quality than it is on facebook i think so that's youtube.com slash geeky justin and Kathy is at CanyonWalkerConnections.com. And if you have ideas for future guests that I should have on this little new show thing that doesn't have a name, then by all means, leave those in the comments because I would love to get a variety of folks, folks I agree with, folks I don't agree with. I, this is not a gotcha show. So like I am open to having positive conversations with anybody because that's that's what I do. And yep. um uh, if you want to make sure that you don't miss future Facebook Live things that I do, uh, if you follow me or if you're my friend on Facebook, you can, um, un when you hover on my name under friends, you can choose get notifications. And if you hover on uh, follow or go under following, you can choose see first and that'll make sure my stuff pops up to the top. You could do that for Kathy as well. 
to get notifications in Z-First. And there's also a thing I think on this live video that you can click to be notified of more live videos. Um, and that's it. That's it. That's all. That's all she wrote. So thanks for letting me be the first, Justin. Thank you for being my <laughs> guinea pig. We've been friends for 13 years. Oh, and this is the first time that I invited you on a video thing. Yeah. I'll it's tell the you. first time I did one like this, though. <laughs> Thank you so much for being on, Thank Kathy. You. Thank you, everybody, for watching. And I'll, and I'll come and answer questions after All right. I snag some dinner. Thanks, everybody. And uh, I apologize again for not being able to answer everybody. But we have so appreciated your being here and uh, hope to see you next time. So see you later. Oh. Bye. Bye. Hmm.